All right. Okay, great. Um, all right, can you guys uh, see the shared screen here? Okay, great. So today, um, I, uh, I want to talk about cryptography. So I'm a number theorist. I was always attracted to the sort of pure beauty of number theory. But um, I find it really fun to have this connection to the real world through cryptography. Um, it's, it's exciting that you could prove a theorem if, if you're working on cryptography, which directly changes what we can do as humans. It's, uh, it's engineering. You could even crash the stock market if you prove the right theorem, I think. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so uh, today I want to give a little bit of an overview of where we are right now with cryptography and how we're undergoing this shift as we build quantum computers. Because right now our cryptography, which we use, um, our public key cryptography, which we use to secure internet transactions, for example, is um, will be broken by quantum computers. And so I want to explain what it is that the quantum computer does that'll break that and how we're trying to replace that cryptography with new cryptography, which will be secure against quantum computers. So it's a bit of a, uh, an overview, a lot of different topics, um, and it pulls on a lot of different pieces of mathematics, which makes it fun, I think. Okay. Um, okay. So right now we have, uh, I mean, public key cryptography some decades ago was a, was a huge shift in thinking um, to even imagine that public key cryptography could be possible, I think, right? Because public key cryptography allows two people who are um, effectively at opposite ends of a crowded room, never having set up anything ahead of time, never having talked to each other ahead of time to be able to share a secret while they're yelling, they just yell over people's heads to show the secret. Everybody in the room can hear everything they say, and yet at the end, they can have a secret, which they can then use as a secret key for, for um, messaging. Um, and, uh, but it is possible, and it's based on this notion of a hard problem, which is the idea that you can, um, that information uh, that would allow the adversary, somebody listening in on that conversation, to break the cryptography it is actually available. It's just that to compute it from the information that they're um, given, listening in, would take longer than the history of the universe on our current computers, right? So it's not that that is impossible, it's that we don't have fast enough algorithms. So these are called hard problems, and one of them is factoring. If we could factor quickly, we would be able to break RSA cryptography. Um, Today, I'm going to focus mostly on, um, on the other two that are the big three that we mostly use right now. Um, and uh, the, so the second one here is discrete log. So we're working mod P. And if you, you know, I have my little doodle here. This is mod P. This is the clock. And if you take some generator G and you look at its powers, you kind of bounce around this clock in some unpredictable way. And so if I were to just pick one of these notches on the clock, some residue mod P, and ask you, what power do I need to take G2 to get that? So I give you G to the S and I ask, what is S? That's actually a hard problem. Um, you're making P very big here, right? So computationally, you can't just compute everything and check. You don't wanna compute all that stuff. You wanna have some way of zeroing in on the answer without exhaustive search. Um, so, so this is the hard problem is I give you some power of my generator and you have to tell me which power it is. Now you can do this in other worlds. So actually the third of the big three that we use right now is the discrete log on elliptic curves. So an elliptic curve is actually a curve. I could draw it in the, in the real plane as, as some, um, some curve like this, but it has the property that you can add points on this curve. And so I can take some point and look at its multiples, which will be other points on the curve. In practice, in the computer, I'm going to do this over a finite field, not over the reals, so I can't draw a picture of it like this. But the algebra all works out. It's a, it's a simple um, formula for adding these points. And it turns out that if I give you some big multiple and I ask you which multiple, what, did I, what multiple did I take to get this point? And I just give it to you as coordinates of that point. You can't figure out from the original point and the point that I give you what multiple I took. Not very easily anyway. Okay, so these are the big three hard problems that, uh, that we have right now. And the important point is that if you, um, if you are uh, 
an adversary trying to break the cryptography that's being used, for example, as people log into their banks or whatever, and you were able to solve these problems with some efficient algorithm so that you could do it, you know, in, in, on human time scales, <laughs> then, um, then you would be able to, to listen in on those, those secrets and that would not be secure anymore. Okay. All right. So, um, so I just want to show you, um, how we actually do this. I'm sure many, if not everybody, is, is perhaps familiar um, with Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So the idea is that uh, I'm going to use this discrete log mod p. So I'm going to set up my modulus p, and I've got some generator g. And now here's Alice and Bob. They're in love in honor of Valentine's Day here. And Alice and Bob want to share a secret. They want to send secret messages to each other so the teacher can't see. And uh, so Alice creates some little secret A, some number, and Bob creates some little secret B. And they're going to keep those secret. They're never going to share those. But what Alice does is she makes G to the A, and that she can publicly share across the crowded room to Bob, because if you see G to the A going by, by the discrete log problem, we think it's hard to find A. So she can take this G to the A, send it over to Bob. He does the same thing, sends his G to the B back. Um, now, Bob doesn't have A, Alice doesn't have B, but they have some sort of version of each other's A and B, which allows them to compute um, something that's shared between them. So Alice over here, if she gets G to the B from Bob, she has her little A, she raises it to A, and she gets G to the A, B. And he can do the corresponding thing and get the exact same um, secret. So they can kind of use each other's secrets in this blinded way. Okay, and that's the idea. Now they have some secret, they can use it as a secret key to actually do communication. They couldn't control what the secret was, they just got some secret piece of info. And this is um, uh, believed to be essentially uh, come down to the discrete log problem. If you really think about it, the adversary here has g to the a, g to the b, and is trying to compute g to the a, b, but nobody has any clever ideas about how to do that besides just trying to find a and b themselves, <laughs> little a and b. <laughs> um, so, so that's the, the, this is what your computer actually does um, when you're logging into to things. So this is, this is just a little illustration, which I, I enjoy. Um, it's not a proof of anything, but this is a picture of this function. If, if we think of G to the A as Alice's public key and G to the B as Bob's public key, I use those as the X and Y axis. Um, and then G to the A, B, this shared secret, I'm graphing it as a function here, but since it's a function over the plane, I'm using color to show what residue I get. And there's some symmetries. So you can see there's symmetries on the diagonals as well as the X and Y axis here. But if you like focus in on one fundamental domain for those basic symmetries, like this triangle here, you see it looks pretty random. We can't predict the shared secret from the two public keys. Um, so this is just sort of a visual illustration of what's going on. And you do see a couple of features. I mean, there's these lines here, but there are some bad choices. So Alice should not pick, for example, zero as her secret A, um, for example. <laughs> so there's a few features, but basically um, this illustrates this, this, this randomness, apparent randomness. Here's a couple examples where I just changed the, the G. All right, so um, with a classical computer, we can't attack this problem. Um, we, uh, we essentially have a search space, which is as big as all the residues mod P. And we could guess randomly, right? And that would take time about P because you'd have to try everything and see, just try all the A's and see if you get to the G to the A. Um, there's also a uh, baby step giant step, which is based um, uh, on the birthday paradox or some slight variation of. And this really does improve things. Your runtime is now square root of P, but this is still what we call exponential. It's still, um, not, not feasible for the size of P that, um, that we're using right now on the internet. Um, the trick here is to make two lists. One of them is where you vary X and you look at H, G to the X, and the other is where you vary Y and you look at G to the M, Y, where M is some, some particular number you're picking. picking. And then if, if you have a collision between these things, then you will have some um, relationship which will allow you to try to solve for the secret S. So, um, we can't do a whole lot better than this. So this, these, al these algorithms here are just in a general group where you're trying to do a discrete log problem, these algorithms will apply. In the elliptic curve version of the discrete log, this is really the best we can do. We, don't, we can use generic algorithms, we don't have very specific algorithms that'll do better, except in very specific um, 
parameter setups, but generically we don't have anything really better than this. In the discrete log mod P, we can do a little bit better um, using some algorithms that are sort of inspired by, um, by uh, some factoring algorithms where we can also do just a little bit better, but it's not good enough. Okay, so these are secure. What we don't have is a polynomial time algorithm, something which would work as a polynomial of log P so that it's the number of digits of P that's the size we're working with instead of the actual P, which is just unmanageably huge. So basically exponential, and in, in my language of you know, talking about cryptography, um, exponential uh, means we can't do it. Polynomial means we can't do it. Exponential is something that's like a polynomial in P and uh, polynomial is something that's like polynomial in a log P. I know the terminology is slightly odd if you're not used to it. Um, but all that is true classically. What about if we have a quantum computer? So um, when, I was a, when I was a graduate student, uh, you know, I had read all of the pop sci books about quantum mechanics and how it does all these weird, bizarre, magical things and so on. Um, and then one day somebody explained to me uh, how to do, you know, what a quantum computer is um, in terms of math. And I was like, oh, it's just linear algebra. And so if you have not had this experience, and many of you probably have because you've you're growing up in the world of quantum computers, but if you've not had this experience to see that what a quantum computer is, is not some really crazy thing, mathematically speaking, it's just a little bit of linear algebra. I'm gonna tell you exactly what is going on in a quantum computer and why it can factor uh, numbers quickly. Okay, so in a classical computer, um, we have bits that can take values zero and one. And a gate is essentially a truth table, some function which takes in a few bits and gives out a bit, okay? Um, we measure how, complicated the algorithm is in space and time. So the number of bits and the number of gates, okay? In a quantum computer, we have a qubit. So I'll tell you what that is. And importantly, there's this concept of entanglement. So you can have several qubits which are entangled. I'll tell you what that means and what a gate is. And then we measure space and time in qubits and quantum gates, okay? All right, so here's, uh, quantum computing in, in 10 minutes, <laughs> my attempts. <laughs> All right, so a qubit um, is really just a linear combination of the possibilities zero and one. So people say it can be in superposition. It's kind of a zero, it's kind of a one. The cat is dead, the cat is alive. All this means is it's a linear combination of them. The coefficients are complex. So um, it's of length one in this sense. So the complex modulus of A squared plus the complex modulus of B squared is one. So if you take that vector of coefficients, Okay, that's what a qubit is, okay? Just a linear combination. Who knows what physics is doing, right? I'm not claiming to explain that. All right, now what, um, what's important about a qubit is you can't actually see it. You can't get A and B, all right? It's supposedly it's doing this linear combination, but it's um, away from your ability to observe. And so what you can do Here's what a qubit is at the top here. Um, what we can do is we can measure it. So we can ask the qubit, are you a zero or a one? And it will declare allegiance to being a zero or a one. And from that moment forth, it will be a zero or a one and the A and B information is destroyed and is gone. So with some probability, it'll say zero. With some probability, it'll say one and it will become that. So the state is destroyed. The um, probabilities are controlled by these coefficients and they conveniently add up to one. So you can either be a zero or a one with some probability one or the other, okay? So measuring the state destroys uh, the state, it collapses and it actually becomes the zero one. You can never measure it again. Okay, so those are the rules. So here's an example. If we've got um, this state, then it has equal probability because this squared is a half and this squared is a half, okay? If we have um, two qubits, then, then you get some really exciting stuff happening. So um, if you have two qubits and we're thinking of them as entangled, they form a system now. They are like talking to each other something. So the, really we have now a, a, an object which has four possibilities. It has zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. Okay, this entangled two qubit system has four possibilities classically. And it's just a linear combination of those possibilities modulus one so that the probabilities of obtaining any of those four states are given by these modulus squared um, quantities, okay? So that's all um, entangled qubits are. 
but they're weird because they don't behave as if they are separate qubits with separate information. They're somehow um, entangled. And I'll do an example to show you what happens. Okay, so first here's a simple example where you have equal probability of measuring 00011011 if you measure the whole system. Okay. I should, uh, you know, because it's Zoom, it's difficult. Are there any questions? Should I stop and check? Okay. Please interrupt plentifully. All right, so um, here's a system. This is a system in which the only possibilities are 0, 0, and 1, 1. You actually, it's impossible for this system to be in a 0, 1, or a 1, 0 um, arrangement. Um, so if you measure the whole system, you will get either 0, 0, or 1, 1. So basically, these qubits are like glued together. They have to agree. So um, one thing you could do is you could measure, even though it's a system, the, um, the power is you could measure just one of the qubits. So you could measure the second qubit and leave the first one floating in the quantum ether, you know? And so um, suppose we were to measure just the second qubit. Well, over here, it's a zero with probability a squared plus c squared, because it's like that could be this state or this one. It's the sum of those probabilities, right? And when you do that, you force it to be zero, because when you measure something, it becomes the thing. And so our new state looks like this. It's got a 0, 0, and a 1, 0, depending on these coefficients a and c. And you just have to, I have to put in a k because I have to scale it to get it to add up to 1. The k is not important, right? It's the ratio between these things that's kind of important. Um, and so these other possibilities are now gone, like I'm xing out the b and the d. Now, if I measure the second bit and I get a 1, that probability is b squared plus d squared, then it'll collapse to just those two. And it's like I'm xing off the a's and the c's. Okay, so this is the weird thing about quantum computers. You can measure just part of the state and you only partially collapse that entangled state so that now you have um, some new state, which is still in superposition, at least as far as the first qubit goes. Um, okay, any questions? All right, so having done that, then here's an example. Um, so if we measure the second qubit in this guy and we get zero, that'll be probably half that we get zero. Then we're in this state where either we have a zero, zero or a one, zero. Right? And similarly for the other guy. Um, okay, and then suppose that we did get a zero that time. So we're in this first situation right here. Then we could go measure the first qubit and we'd have zero or one with equal probability. We get this guy or this guy with equal probability. So that all seems pretty normal. We get, we measure the second qubit, half, half chance, measure the first qubit, half, half chance. These are in essence not entangled. There's no sort of information about one or the other. They're not, the, prob the, the behavior of the second digit is not influencing the probabilities for the first digit. But with this state, there's, a, there's something weird going on. If I measure the second qubit to be a zero, the state collapses to zero, zero, and then when I measure the first qubit, I will absolutely necessarily get a zero. So if I measure the second one to be zero, it forces the first one to be zero. Um, and um, so that means that the first one's probabilities depend upon what you measured for the second one. And that's the entanglement. That's the, the special weird behavior of entangled qubits. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So there, we did, we did the hard part. That's um, what a qubit is and what entangled qubits are. And so qubit's just a unit vector, a linear combination of the classical states you might have. And entangled qubits are a linear combination of the states you could have for n bits, which is two to the n possible states. And there's sort of part of the power of the quantum computer, two to the n is a big number. Okay, um, and what's a gate? Well, a gate, so we just have vectors as the qubits, the, the states, right? A gate is a linear transformation. What do you do to vectors? You do linear transformations, right? So. Um, it should be unitary because you want to preserve the length. Remember, we're requiring them to always have length one. So think of these like as rotations in the complex space. Okay? That's what um, gates are. So you can take your state, which is a vector, and you can like rotate it over here. So here's an example of a Hadamard gate on one qubit. One qubit has two coefficients. It's a vector in C2. So this is a two by two matrix. So if my vector has AB, 
that I'm applying the matrix to the, vec to the um, vector AB and I get some new stuff and interpret it as a state, right? So this is just the physics version of writing this vector <laughs> with, your, with your cat notation over here. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, that's what quantum gates are. All right. If you have one qubit state, then you're using a two by two gate. If you have a two qubit state, you need a four by four gate. A three qubit state, there's eight possible classical um, possibilities. So that's an eight by eight gate. Okay. Um, and you can do like regular computations. That's really the point of this slide. So here is a gate which does C naught. So um, depending on whether the first bit is a zero or a one, I will change the second one. So if it's a zero, I don't change it. Okay, and if it's a one, then I do change it. Zero becomes one. If it's a one in the first position, the second position, one becomes zero. So this is essentially the way that you would do not. Um, and, uh, and you can do all the sort of basic, basic arithmetic operations you could do on a classical computer. You just have to be a little careful because on the classical computer, these are all invertible gates. So everything, like you can't lose information. So you have to kind of set things up a little carefully, but you can do it is the point. And, um, and so for example, you could start with this state where you have x in your first register, however many qubits is in that register, and then your second register is zeroed out, and then you can compute some function that you could compute on a classical computer and, and store the information in that second gate. So you can do like the, the same stuff that you could do classically. You can do it on the states. And the thing is, this, um, this guy is acting on the superposition. So in some sense, it can do it to all of the classical states simultaneously. Okay, so basically, oops. Uh, okay, well, I'm gonna say that in one slide. So let me just um, sum up that we've decided gates are just matrices, unitary matrices, and we can count qubits and gates here again to talk about time and space for a quantum computer. Okay, so let me, um, so let me take a break for a second and say um, a little bit about what they can do. And then I'll explain a little bit about how they do that using the math that we just did. So, um, in the classical versus quantum situation, how different is it to factor an integer, say? Okay, so classically, we can do a little bit better than exponential. Here's the actual runtime. Um, but on a quantum computer, it is polynomial, which means that it's a function of log n, a polynomial function of log n, the number of digits of the input integer. So if I give you a 200 digit integer, it's only twice as hard as a 100 digit integer to factor. Okay, that's the point. And, um, and so uh, log n number of qubits, log n number of gates to some power. Okay. The discrete log problem, same problem. We can, um, uh, we can do, sorry, this should say sub-exponential here, the same as up here, just to typo. Um, if you're mod p, you can do slightly sub-exponential for an elliptic curve, you can really only do root n. Um, but on a quantum computer, it becomes polynomial again. It's very similar to factoring in terms of the work. Um, but a quantum computer is not magic. It can do this one thing really well, and I'll explain why, but it can't just like do anything that a classical com computer can do um, in polynomial time. <laughs> it's not magic. So for example, if you're searching for something with a classical computer, you would have to like just search the space. It would take about O of n time before you happened upon the right thing. Quantum computer can do slightly better, bizarrely. It can do um, O of root n, but the, this is not the kind of improvement that gets you down to polynomial. It's not like the kind of difference you're seeing up here with factoring. So quantum computers have a very specific power, and I'm going to try to tell you what that is um, in a minute, and it lets you break the cryptography we have. It's like super specific to that. Um, and then um, if you can turn some classical problem into that kind of problem, then a quantum computer can break it to pieces, but not every problem is like that. Um, okay, so what is, the, what is the real power of the quantum computer? Well, what it can do is it can essentially operate on all of the possible gates, uh, all possible states, sorry, um, simultaneously. So if I have a sum, think of this sum over all the possible inputs to some function. So like, this is a superposition. Um, I haven't bothered scaling it to be length one here, just scale it to be length one. So this is like the, um, you know, it's even probability of all X's is my superposition. And x, this could be a large number of qubits in this register. So x could go from 0 to 2 to the something, right? So, um, so this is like all possible ways that um, some number of classical bits could uh, be holding a piece of information. And I can just 
with one uh, series of quantum gates, I can do the operation of computing f of x on all of those possible inputs at once. That's exponentially many things, two to the n things. With n qubits, I can do on two to the n inputs. What is the output? I just do it in parallel. So it's this sort of massive, massive parallelism in the quantum computer. It can do that, but it's doing it in the quantum state where we can't see it. And the problem is we can't see the result. So it's not magic. You can't like just suddenly everything is parallel. It can do everything that you want because you can't actually get out the answer. <laughs> it can do it, but you can't get the answer. Um, and so there's only in these very specific situations where you can pull the answer out. Okay. So, um, so here's how you, how, you, how you factor or solve the discrete log problem. The first thing you have to do, and I'm just going to skip over this for, for time, is classically you have to convince yourself that solving that problem comes down to finding the period of some function. So in, in the factoring, the hint is Euler's theorem, right? You want to factor, take your number as a modulus, and then the exponents of things behave a particular way. So anyway, so there's some function. I'm just going to start this as a black box. There's some function. And if you could find the period of that function, then you would solve your problem. Okay, so if you can turn your problem into that question, then the quantum computer can help you. So um, here's our, we classically reduce the problem to finding the period. And what we're going to do is we're going to store this linear combination of, so my, my superpos superposition is all the possible input states. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and I have the zero hanging out, that's space to do a computation. Okay, so it's the quantum computer, this isn't hard, you can actually set it up to be like, in equally probable in all states. And then here's my function. Suppose it looks like this and it's periodic, so it goes do, 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 forever, okay? Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask the quantum computer to compute x goes to f of x on all those states simultaneously. So now I have one and f of one, two and f of two, three and f of three, and this is all stored in the quantum state in the computer, okay? So I've computed this function on all the inputs, and then what I do is I measure the second register over here. So I ask the second register, what are you? Well, it's equally probable to be all these different things, but it'll pick one. So say it picks this to be. It decides I'm going to be whatever this value of f of x is. So what that will essentially do is now this quantum state can't be in the one or the two possibilities anymore. It has to be either three or the six or the nine. Okay, so it basically like X's out all those other possibilities and they're gone. And your quantum state now looks like this. Okay, so now your quantum state is periodic in its coefficients, right? Like I've got coefficient 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. So the coefficients are carrying the periodicity you're looking for. You still can't get the answer out because if I measure this, it's just going to give me some value x and f of x. We don't have any control or any information from that. So measuring now is not going to help me, but I can apply a quantum Fourier transform, which is just a unitary matrix. So if this is my coefficients, they're periodic, after the QFT, which is just a discrete Fourier transform, you will get this kind of picture of the coefficients in the state. And so now these states are not likely, these ones are very likely. So there's only like three possible very likely states if your period is three. Now, when you measure this, you're very likely to measure this guy because this is the big coefficient. And so now you get like a reliable piece of information out. And if you measure this and it's like a third of the way from here to here, then you guess, oh, the period was three. Okay, so that's, I'm brushing a lot of details under the carpet, but the magic of the quantum computer here is this trick of using the Fourier transform to change something where measurement gives you no information to something where measurement gives you information. And the kind of information that you can get from a Fourier transform is period information. So a quantum computer can tell you about the period of a function. Okay. So it really is a very specific algorithm, but it is very powerful because it is polynomial time. Because what you do, these quantum gates, you know, you do a few gates to compute here, and then you do the QFT, which is just one gate, and then you measure. It's like, it doesn't take any time at all. You do need to build the quantum computer though. There's that. All right, so why is discrete logarithm problem period finding? Well, here's our discrete log problem. Given a G and a G to the S, we wanna find that S. We can make it um, into a sort of period finding problem by writing it as a, um, 
uh, by, by, by considering this function here. So inputs x and y, I do g to the x times h to the negative y. Okay, now h is my g to the s secretly. So this looks like g to the x plus s minus y. So the kernel of this map, for example, would be where x is equal to s y. So if you could write down the kernel of this map, it would give away the secret s. Okay, and um, when you do period finding, you're essentially asking for the kernel that's kind of like the, the period of a function. Okay, so more generally, it can find kernels of functions um, like this. Okay, so um, so when you measure, you'll end up, um, you know, you'll you'll pick out the values where this function is the same, and those are the cosets of the kernel. And then you do some sort of special quantum Fourier transform for this group, and you will be able to get the um, the answer. What is that kernel? Okay, so the same sort of algorithm, um, but just with a little bit of group theory, will um, will give you a classical quantum, uh, sorry, not classical, a quantum polynomial algorithm for solving the discrete log problem and the internet will be broken, okay? All right, so now I wanna tell you about how we can fix this. So now that I've explained what the quantum computer can do, I wanna um, talk about what are the, the proposals for fixing this. So right now, um, NIST uh, is running a competition to standardize the future quantum secure uh, cryptographic protocols that we will all switch to or add a layer of perhaps on the internet and, um, <laughs> and wherever we need cryptography. So they want to be able to do key exchange and signatures. Um, they're running several rounds. So people put in proposals based on um, new mathematical uh, hard problems and, uh, but there's specific implementations um, of these, these things as cryptographic protocols and then they're analyzed um, there, you know, there's public comment, et cetera, and they like whittle them down and they're eventually going to announce a winner. All right. So the, the categories that got proposed are largely lattice-based, isogeny-based, code-based, and multivariate. Multivariate means uh, like solving multivariable polynomials. Code-based means um, like coding theory. And I'm going to talk about lattice-based and isogeny-based because these are ones that I've spent time working on. And I enjoy trying to cryptanalyze these things. So I'm working on how hard is the hard problem? Are there fast algorithms classically or quantumly um, for these hard problems? So I wanna tell you what the hard problems are and why the quantum computer um, method doesn't work. Or does it work? Question? I can name it some way, son. Yeah, go for it. I actually did have a question. I'm currently in a very low level mathematical cryptography class. And we just recently started talking about how the Chinese remainder theorem has been used to solve the discrete logarithmic discrete logarithm problem. And I was wondering if you could go just a little bit more into that and how um, we've moved past that. Um, well, so there, uh, so I'm not sure um, exactly which thing you might be referring to, but for the discrete log problem, when you're working mod P, um, the factorization of P minus one can affect the security of the problem. So if that P minus one has some sort of special factorization, um, and it breaks into pieces, then there's an approach that has to do with Chinese remainder theorem, um, which will allow you to sort of break the problem into separate pieces and do them each individually. And the power of Chinese remainder theorem is if I can solve these problems individually, I can piece them together into the full solution. So one of the things that we do in cryptography is we, um, we try not to have P minus one have certain kinds of factorizations. So, um, so there are all these um, subtle details about how you pick the parameters of your problem. And that's even more true of the post-quantum candidates than it is of the, the ones we've talked about so far. Um, in special cases, there are special types of attacks. And I didn't mention those in what I was talking about here just because I was trying to um, stick to the general. But uh, same is true for elliptic curves. There's certain classes of elliptic curves. If you pick your curve badly, then there are um, attacks and stuff. And so as people learn those, that's part of the whole mathematical endeavor. We try to break these things. We come up with special classes where we can. And then the cryptographers rule those classes out and when they don't get used on the internet because we know they're insecure. Um, so that's part of the whole, the whole process. Does that help? Was that what you were talking about? Yes, it was. Thank you so much. Any other questions right now? I have a question. Uh, 
in a, in a quantum gates and i i saw that you have used the uh, discrete fourier transform mm -hmm. i mean quantum fourier transform in there is there is there a possibility that we could use a discrete cosine or discrete sine transform instead of discrete fourier transform for mm -hmm. the quantum fourier gates I, oh, is no, it benefit, I, beneficial or not? I don't know. That's a great <laughs> question. And my expertise, I don't think, lies in answering that question. So I, um, my, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Um, the quantum Fourier transform, it's called the quantum Fourier transform. When it comes right down to it, it really is just the regular discrete Fourier transform. Yeah. Um, and because I was thinking, like, say, uh, the discrete Fourier transform is a unitary matrix, mm -hmm. and then uh, discrete cosine and sine transform are uh, orthogonal matrices. So, which nicer? I mean, uh, it's not complex, so it's nice. They have beautiful properties, similar to discrete Fourier transform. I mean, maybe it will save a little bit of computational complexity maybe i don't know I, i'm just asking yeah no that's a cool question i um like i said i don't really know the answer but what i can say maybe is that you're stuck in the in the complex numbers with a quantum computer and um you really need the gates to be unitary matrices um and you need to allow your coefficients to be complex you can't like force them to be real or something like that um and so you would have to put it in that context in which case you might just be recovering the the original i don't know i, um, I if that is the case if i can convert those matrices into the complex form will i be able to yeah if you have a unitary matrix then it's a then it's a quantum gate okay okay yeah because like discrete fourier and discrete cosine are related nicely beautifully May, maybe right i don't know I'm, yeah I'm, no it's I'm an curious. interesting question yeah. yeah because i work in a discrete cosine and sine most of mm -hmm. the time so i'm curious to see how it works yeah, so I think a lot of, as a general philosophical comment, I think there's a lot of space in uh, in quantum computing for like, there's got to be some new big ideas because the quantum computer right now, we have a few big ideas for things that we can do that we can't do classically. Shor's algorithm is like the, the yeah. big main one that um, the people talk about. And then there's a few other things that, are, that really are something quantum computer can do that classically we can't. Um, but they're like these clever ideas. And I don't feel like we know for sure that the, 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 that the unexplored space doesn't include other amazing algorithms. It's, it's hard to learn to think in the quantum computer way. And as we get better at it, I think people might come up with some new interesting stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So um, yeah, any other questions right now? Because this is a breaking point in the talk too. Now we're going post-quantum. All right, I think I'm slow <laughs> looking at the time. When uh, when am I supposed to finish? I think around 12. Okay. All right, so I want to talk about the, the lattice-based and isogeny-based cryptography possibilities. So lattice-based cryptography, give you the, the quick rundown as to what it is. So a lattice is what you think it is. It's like literally a lattice, maybe in... A vector space in Rn is the way you might visualize it, but n is very big when we're talking about lattices. That's the size of the problem. So like high dimensional lattices. Two dimensional lattices like the one on the screen are actually easy to deal with. So, um, but they're good for explaining the concepts. So this lattice, this is a uh, basically a Z linear span of some basis vectors. Um, and I could pick some nice basis vectors like this green parallelogram here, right? So this guy and this guy could be my basis vectors. Or I could pick some horrible ones like this guy and this guy here. What makes those horrible? Well, they're harder to tell if I were to pick some like random point here, what its linear combination is that you need to get to that point, right? This guy, it's kind of easy to visualize. If I want to get short vectors, I use short linear combinations of these guys. So something about the geometry is different in these two situations, the green and the red. And algebraically, there is no difference. A basis is a basis. So it's the geometry. It's talking about angle. These are long and they're not orthogonal. So um, we have to give the lattice some geometry. So there's a notion of length and angle. So for example, if this is my origin here, these are the short vectors. And a nice basis has short vectors, okay? So um, what kinds of problems could you ask? 
where you could give somebody a lattice and to hand them a lattice, what can you do? You can hand them a bunch of vectors as a basis, right? Like, what are you gonna do? You're gonna hand them a matrix. So if I've given them a bad one, these problems become difficult. Find the shortest vector or a vector within some factor of the shortest in your lattice. So if this is the origin, here's a short vector. Find that guy. If I give you a bad basis, like over here, it could be hard to find this vector if I'm just given these two, okay? Or the closest vector problem. I give you a dot somewhere and I ask for what's the closest element of the lattice to that dot, okay? So those are the kinds of problems that um, we use as hard problems in lattices. And uh, just as a, as a, a quick overview, if you um, ask about the shortest vector problem, which people just call SVP, um, you can kind of ask for, well, how short do you want? Do you want like the shortest or do you want within like factor of 10 of the shortest? Okay, so that factor is, is alpha and it lets you set how hard the problem is. If I want the shortest, alpha is very small, that's a very hard problem. And if I want, if I let alpha be very big, a few orders of magnitude, then it's an easy problem. And so we have this sort of um, trade-off graph where if I let alpha be big, um, then the time taken, but using the best known algorithms, which are um, BKZ or LLL variations, will be small. And if I want alpha to be very small, like polynomial in the dimension, then the time taken will be like exponential in the dimension. Remember, the dimension is the size of this problem. And so this is long time, this is short time. <laughs> this is a long vector is all I need. This is, I really want a short vector. Okay, so the point is cryptography lives over here. We're going to do cryptography with lattices where we pick big dimension um, and we require finding a very short vector to solve the problem. And that makes it take too long. And that's why it's a hard problem. Okay. Um, but we're working on a computer, so we can actually work in Rn. So what we actually do is we work in a finite field to some dimension. Okay. So this is just mod q. And this is the problem we're going to use. And this is related to those other problems that I mentioned that have a very geometric flavor. It's not really different, but it's phrased kind of differently. You have a secret, which is a vector somewhere in this very high dimensional space, which has lots of room. So you can't search it exhaustively. And I'm going to give you a linear system and you want to solve it. Now you look at this and you're like, well, that's not a, wait, wait, that's not a hard problem, right? <laughs> what do you do? You use Gaussian elimination. If I give you A and B, you can solve for S. Well, what they do is they make it hard by saying approximately solves, and they add an error to the information you're given. So S doesn't exactly solve AS equals B, but if you add some error to B or to AS, depending on how you think about it, then it will be a solution, okay? And if you, uh, I'm sure many of you um, study this sort of thing, if I try to do Gaussian elimination on this, it's going to amplify those errors. It's not a stable situation and you you can't use it, it's gone, okay? So this makes it a hard problem. It makes doing linear algebra a hard problem all of a sudden. So it's a very clever idea because doing linear algebra is the kind of thing that like we're good at. It's the only thing mathematicians are good at, right? It's linear algebra. Maybe that's not true, I don't know. <laughs> but we make it hard by adding this little bit of error and then all of a sudden we can use the linear algebra formalism so that we can still kind of like design cryptography but, but the problem becomes hard. Okay, so here's a, here's a picture of what we're doing, right? Here's A, S plus E equals B. If we think about this, um, we're just dotting these rows with uh, the vector S. So these are a bunch of dot products. So I could take these row by row. And for whatever reason, this is kind of the way that we talk about this. We talk about it as giving a bunch of samples. So a row is a sample. It's a dot product plus a small error and then the result. So I'm going to give you A and I'm going to give you this result, A, S plus E, without you knowing S and E individually. Okay, so I give you two numbers. I give you one vector. Sorry, they're not numbers. I guess the first one's a vector and then the second one is a number. And I just give you a bunch of these. Um, in the process of the cryptography, this is what is being yelled across the room is a bunch of these samples. And uh, what about that error? Um, I just want it to be short. So, so you could even pick zeros, ones, and minus ones. Okay, like compared to FQ, where Q is a fairly big print. So this could be a picture of um, the probability of different vectors in your lattice being an error vector. Okay. Ideas, things that are short near the origin somehow. All right, but, um, so that's actually, you can do, some of the NIST proposals are based just on what I told you, but because I'm a number theorist, I'm interested in the proposals where they added some algebraic structure. So people did that because, um, uh, 
because it adds a little bit more um, structure, which allows the, the use of the cryptography to be more efficient. It's got to go super quick if you're going to use it in your browser. That's very important criteria in this competition. And so adding this extra symmetry, this extra information to the system, so it's not just a vector space, now it's going to be a ring, is going to improve the crypto. But there's always this question, does it make the problem easier? So you improve the crypto efficiency, but you might be losing in security. And that's the interesting question. And a lot of my work is focused um, on this question for, for um, this quote unquote learning with errors problem. I don't know where the name came from. It's just the name of this problem. <laughs> Actually, I do know where the name came from, but I'm not gonna explain it because it's weird. Anyway, so um, if you add a ring, then you call it ring learning with errors. Okay, so this is still a vector space, but now I'm also thinking of it as a ring. I'm gonna think of it as polynomials. Um, with coefficients in FQ, so, so coefficients mod Q, and I'm reducing modulo X to the N plus one. So um, whenever I multiply, I just reduce large powers in this way. Okay, so now it's a ring. And now um, what I can do is I can actually just this B, so multiplying by some element of the ring is a linear transformation. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna change the problem slightly. I'm gonna say A and then B is just A times S in the ring plus some error in the ring. Okay, so these are just two elements of the ring. And you can think of this as an instance of the LWB problem if you wanna go back and think of that as a linear transformation. This is just like a few samples. So it's not really a different problem. I've just added some extra structure to it. Okay. But now I have ring elements that I'm multiplying. I can have a search version of this where I have a fixed secret. I'm given some samples and I try to find the secret. Or I could have a decision problem where I'm given a bunch of samples and I have to tell whether these samples were total garbage somebody made up randomly or actual samples that work for some S. And um, I just have to be able to tell the difference. I don't have to find S, I just have to know whether they were random garbage or whether there exists in S. And it turns out that you can base the cryptography essentially, um, there's some reductions so that you can base it on one or the other um, and study either of these for your hardness um, in, in many situations anyway. Um, okay, I already said that. Okay, so now let me go back to why the quantum computer can't solve this one, okay? So in discrete log, we're given a G and a G to the S, and we want to find S. In um, the elliptic curve discrete log, same kind of thing, except it's a point on an elliptic curve, so P and S times P, find S. Here we're given A and AS plus E, that's the part that makes it hard, and we have to find S. So formally, it looks very, very similar. What's good about that is that we can design things like the Diffie-Hellman key exchange on the same principles. We can kind of imitate the things we did with the pre-quantum cryptography with this kind of post-quantum cryptography, the sort of same protocols. We can just tweak them to make them work in this new situation. So the formal similarity here is really advantageous. Um, but why doesn't then the quantum computer, which attacked these two things because of the format of this problem, not work here? Well, what happens is you have to turn it into period finding. Remember for the discrete log, we had a trick. We looked at this function, which had as its kernel um, information which would leak S. So what should we do here? We could try to do the same thing. Now we're writing additively, but it would look kind of the same, right? We'd have AX, and then we'd have this other part of the sample, the AS plus E that we're given. We can't break this into pieces because we don't know S and E individually, but we're given this thing. We could multiply it by Y. So we could compute this function, but the problem is there's this error. So instead of a nice periodic function, we have a periodic function with noise. And the quantum computer can't handle that at all. The Fourier transform is gonna pick up that noise and it's not gonna work. So, um, so it just, it, it breaks Shor's algorithm essentially. Okay. So, um, so, this is, so this is great because it allows you to keep the formalism, but it, um, but it breaks this uh, sort of delicate, I, part of my point is the quantum computer is in a way kind of delicate, the, the power of the quantum computer. It's not, it's not some magic oracle. It, it does this very specific thing and adding a little bit of noise breaks it. All right, um, so I see that I don't have um, very much time. So I'm actually going to skip talking a little bit about some of the attacks and just sum it up by saying, that adding the ring structure does let you have some attacks that don't work in the generic non-ring situation. And I had a few slides about that and I can go back to some of those um, at some point if somebody wants. But, but I figured for the last few minutes, I should talk just a little bit about isogeny-based crypto so I can put it in the same framework and show you um, what the hard problem is, okay? 
All right, so in isogeny-based cryptography, don't worry about what isogeny means, you're working on a graph. Now we have to, later on, we have to figure out what this graph is, but for telling you how it works, it's really like, it's very, very much like the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, but you're working in a graph. So the idea is in this graph here, there are short steps and there are long steps. And these are the vertices here. And there's one starting vertex, which I've made a little bit bigger. Everybody knows that starting vertex, everybody knows how to navigate the graph. Okay, so on this graph, they can take steps. They can, you can say, take a short step, take a long step, and they can compute that and get the new vertex. Okay. All right, so Alice and Bob have copies of the same graph. Now, what Alice does as her sort of secret key is she will compute some path. So long, long, short, short was her path. Okay. Bob will do the same short, 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 long was his secret path. Okay. Then Alice could share her path with Bob and Bob could share, I guess I did the other way first. So Bob shared his path with Alice. So now Alice has Bob's path and she could do her path starting from his end point instead of from the, the global starting point. So starting from over here, she could do long, long, short, short. Okay, so long, long, short, short. Now Alice gives her path to Bob and from her end point, he could do his path, which is short, 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 long. And look, they end up at the same ending point. So this is a lot like the Diffie-Hellman where Alice had something she did to G, G, she did G to the A, and then she gave that result to Bob and then he did to the B, right? So like raising to the A was like the first path and raising to the B is the second path and they commute with one another. So this is the same idea. It's very formally similar. And you'll notice that Alice doesn't actually have to give her whole path to Bob. She can just give the end point, right? So instead of giving him the whole path, she just tells him where to start his path. And in that way, she keeps her secret key, the actual path, secret, and the public key, the G to the A, is just the end point of the path. Okay, so it's very formally similar to DLP. And the question is just how do you make a good graph that will work for this so that knowing the end point of a path is different from knowing the path, right? Because now the hard problem has to be if I have an end point, I, I want it to be hard to recover the actual path because the end point is the public key and the path is the private key. So, um, so the answer is elliptic curves, again, uh, probably because they're lying around and people know about them. And so somebody, uh, you know, thought, had a good idea. Um, sorry, throughout this talk, because I've been talking so generally and, and large scale, I haven't been giving names and citations for everything. Um, but there are a lot of, uh, there, there are too many to name. But um, anyway, so, uh, so yeah, so elliptic curves. Um, they, like I said before, uh, here's an example. This is this is the form the form of an elliptic curve. And in rainbow, I have a family of elliptic curves here. So there's a blue elliptic curve and then a green elliptic curve and so on. They have an additional loss. So as I said before, you can add points. And in the interest of time, I'm going to skip saying exactly how you build that. But the point is that you can actually get a formula for it. So if I have some points, here's its coordinates. And this, I've got a Q, here's its coordinates. Then there's a P plus Q. Not, not that bad. I mean, it could be worse, right? So we did use this for the elliptic curve discrete log problem. You just add a point to itself many times um, and then ask how many times. But instead of doing that, what we're going to do is we're going to build a graph um, using isogenies. So I have to add one more bit to the structure, which is a map between elliptic curves. So now instead of using one curve and its points, I'm going to take a whole class of curves and I'm going to talk about the maps between them, which are called isogenies. And here's an example. Here's one elliptic curve. Here's another elliptic curve. This map, coordinates on this point, if you do that to them, there will be coordinates of a point on this equation. Okay, so these are um, maps between the curves and they're actually group homomorphisms. Okay, so, um, so they preserve the group structure and that means there's a lot of structure going on. There's a lot of deep and interesting number theory going on. The one aspect I wanna focus on for an isogeny is that it has a degree, which is just the size of its kernel. So this guy um, kills these three points, the identity point, um, and then this coordinate and this coordinate. So we call it a three isogeny because it kills three things. So now I can tell you what the graph is. The vertices are elliptic curves and the edges are, you draw an edge for every L isogeny. So you pick and fix an L like three, like this L is small, like three. And then you draw an edge for every three isogeny. And if you have a three isogeny going out, you have one back for the most part. So you, you don't even have to think of it as directed. That's the graph you use. And the important thing is that in this graph, you can label the curves by what's called the J invariant, which is just a function of the coefficients. You can recover the coefficients from the J invariant. So you're basically giving the equation of the curve. 
And for the isogenies, you can say what the kernel is. But what's hard in this setup with, these, with this labeling of this graph, it's hard if I give you two vertices, two J invariants, to find a path, a sequence of isogenies or kernels, which will get you from one to the other. And that's what keeps the secret key secret. I remember Alice can just send her endpoint, but nobody knows the path. And in order to compute the full endpoint of the two paths, you would need to have the paths, at least one of them. Um, and so, um, so this is the hard problem that makes, that makes it tick. Okay. And so, um, uh, and so now I can say why this breaks Troy's algorithm, and that'll be a good place to stop. So remember that um, in the, um, uh, the regular discrete log problem, right, we've got G and G to the S, we want to compute S. This looks very similar because you've got an E and an S times E where S is this path. And it turns out that in this situation, the path is actually an action of a group. So um, you, can, you can talk about it as a group action. Um, so it looks very, very similar actually. And it allows you to do the same, build the same protocol. So again, it has the same power in terms of building protocols as the pre-quantum stuff, but it breaks Troy's algorithm for the following reason. It's just a little bit different. Remember, this was the map that would have a kernel we could recover. Um, in our case, we have X times E and we can do Y inverse S times E. These are elements of a group, so that's okay, we can do that. But we can't put them together. And the reason is these are not elements of the group. These are things that have been acted on by the group. And the set, you can't take two elements of the set the group is acting on and combine them. So you can't do this multiplication in the middle between these two things. You can act individually by those exponents, but then you can't compare them. Um, and so you don't have a function and Shor's algorithm breaks again. Um, and so I see my time is exactly up. And so I should, I should stop with some doodles. Thank you all. You have to spend. Do you have any questions? I think maybe we have time for one week questions. <laughs> There's one question on the Zoom, it looks like. They say thank you. you. Is there any question from here? Yeah, there's a question from Diana. Um, hello. Hi, my name is Diana. Um, so I'm an undergraduate student and I have a question. So um, like I would, I really am interested in cryptography and I was wondering like, what would be your advice like moving forward? And I just want to say like, I really enjoyed your talk and it's been really awesome. So thank you so much. Thank you. So you're interested in getting into cryptography? Yes, like I've tried, um, like I've got some textbooks and like I, I'm thinking of taking applied cryptography when it's offered next. Mm -hmm. And so um, like the, it was just really cool. Like I was really excited for this event. So thank you. So um, my advice for people who might be interested in, in heading in the direction of cryptography is that cryptography is actually kind of a, um, it's got this interdisciplinary uh, thing going on between computer science and mathematics. And you can actually access um, a cryptography academic path through either. So um, you can go the, the CS side, you could go, for example, to a CS graduate program and, um, and learn about cryptography and work on cryptography there. Um, Lattice-based cryptography, I think most of the, uh, sort of a larger portion of the researchers, I think, come from the CS side. Um, and you can also do a math um, direction. You could do a math uh, graduate program and study number theory and then do cryptography from there. And then you will get to interact between the, the two communities. And I think the isogeny-based cryptography, for example, um, is uh, right now more of the activity, um, I'd say, is on, is on the math side. So it's, it's nice that it's this, like, uh, bridge between the two. And depending on your interests, you can work on cryptography in the very theoretical side. So what I do is I'm, I'm trying to analyze these hard problems. Um, but you can also work on cryptography on the engineering side. How do you use these hard problems to actually build things people can use? And you can have it also go all the way to the engineering side into implementations, and you can study things like um, side channel attacks, like how can you break cryptography by analyzing chips and the figuring out what they're doing instead of talking about the underlying math hard problem at all, but like, was it implemented safely or not? Um, and so uh, the, the, that's one thing that I like about is the interdisciplinary aspect is you can go a lot of different directions depending on your interest. Um, and you can focus on a lot of different parts of cryptography while still being involved in the, the wider community.
Thank you so much for that response. And again, like it was very like inspiring. Like, thank you. Thank you. We have one question from her. Uh, she asked, like, can you tell us about uh, what you draw on the slides? Especially the one on the right side. <laughs> these, are, these are some doodles. Um, so, uh, so this is an isogeny graph. So the elliptic curves, remember, they kind of look like this, right? So these are elliptic curves that are the vertices, and they look like little fishes, and there's the isogenies connecting them. And this is a lattice, um, looks kind of like a lattice. And, um, and the, the, the idea behind, oh, this is, this is a quantum computer over here. So these are like entangled qubits. I don't know, quantum computers always look like, like metal cylinders hanging from the ceiling in my mind. And then, um, and this is a little sign saying, hi, I'm a quantum computer. So basically the idea behind this doodle is um, you, you could have different perspectives on what's going on in, in crypto, uh, in this post-quantum crypto process. Like maybe the isogenies and the lattices are duking it out to see who's going to be king for the future, you know, who's going to take over the internet and be the, the dominant use cryptography. Or you could think of it as these guys are collaborating to try to break down quantum computers and make them not uh, dangerous anymore. So, um, so yeah, these are just things out of my brain, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kate. 